going on right now. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our board president, Deborah Balaga. And I hope I'm saying your, your last name right. I've never actually had to say it out loud. <laughs> Great. You got it right. Excellent. Um, she's going to go ahead and introduce us to this speaking series and to our speaker tonight and give you kind of a, a rundown on, on how things will work. So without further ado, Deborah. Uh, thank, thank you, Amanda. I, uh, for those of you who don't know, Amanda has joined us fairly recently, and she's just been a fabulous addition to our uh, leadership team. So thank you. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the kickoff for the return of our regular general meetings. Um, as those of you who have been with us a long time know, uh, we have been doing general meetings for quite some time, uh, and they got disrupted by the pandemic and various other changes along the way. And we're so excited to be returning with regular meetings. Uh, it's one of our most popular programs. And what we heard over the last year or two is please bring them back. Uh, and I couldn't be more thrilled than to kick it off with Professor Hinshaw. Uh, as a personal note, when I first got involved with NAMI in 2016, 2017, uh, Professor Hinshaw was the speaker at a general meeting, the very first one I ever attended. And without a doubt of all the speakers along the way, it had the most impact for me. Uh, it was an extraordinary presentation about stigma uh, and his personal journey, uh, and it was really transformative for me. So I'm delighted that Professor Hinshaw is kicking off the return. Uh, and I will just say very briefly, uh, if uh, you haven't already looked uh, or received uh, our notices, we have just an all-star lineup for our fall. We're starting with uh, Professor Hinshaw, uh, and then uh, in October, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Thomas Sinsel, who was the former head of the uh, National Institute of Mental Health. And since uh, stepping down from that position, he has been a, a very vocal advocate for really profound changes to mental health delivery systems, and, uh, very, very uh, creative. Uh, and then uh, in November, we have a very different kind of speaker, uh, uh, Scott Stossel, uh, who is the editor in chief of the Atlanta ma Magazine, Atlantic Magazine, and he uh, is going to speak about his lifelong struggle with really profound anxiety disorder. Uh, it's very, very interesting. He has spoken publicly about this. He's written a book about it. So keep an eye out for our all-star lineup. Um, the other thing I would just say at the outset is for those of you who follow our programs, we, we have three different speaker series. This speaker series is really sort of high level policy experts. Uh, then we have our virtual learning table, uh, which is more for local uh, mental health providers to help educate people about the resources available. And then we have our storytelling series where uh, individuals with lived experience share their journeys with family members to help educate and reduce stigma. Over the next few months, we'll be sending emails clarifying are ever growing stable of speaker events because they're so well received. Um, with that, I want to say that um, I introduce Professor Henshaw. Um, I would be here all night if I began to talk about all of his credentials and experience. It's really phenomenal. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to Google him and take a look at uh, the uh, UC Berkeley uh, webpage. It's really phenomenal. Uh, he is. Um, Distinguished Professor of Psychology, former department chair at UC Berkeley, author of more than 400 articles, books, et cetera, recognized with awards by prestigious organizations uh, all over the place uh, and on and on. And I will say that, uh, again, to make this personal, uh, one of his publications was shortly uh, before he spoke at, in 2017 to us, uh, and it was really transformative for me. Uh, it's called Another Kind of Madness, A Journey Through the Stigma and Hope of Mental Illness. Uh, and I have referred to his research and his thinking uh, many, many times when I go out in the community to educate the community about stigma, uh, about what the journey is like for families and individuals. So I want to thank Professor Hinshaw for being willing to come and talk with us tonight. Um, he will, I will let him explain what he's going to be talking about. Uh, some of it is stigmas, but other topics involve uh, recent research and thinking that he's been intimately involved with uh, that he wanted to share with all of us. Uh, so with that, I will talk about the mundane, boring things. Um, as Amanda said, um, 
the, the basic structure is that Professor Hinshaw will speak for 45 minutes or an hour um, by way of presentation, and then we'll have a half an hour or more uh, of Q&A. Uh, for purposes of the questions and question and answer uh, time, uh, as Amanda alluded to, what we would ask you to do is to send a private uh, chat to Dr. Robert Reiser, my good friend and fellow board me member and uh, prominent psychologist in, uh, in, in Marin. Uh, for those of you who have participated in our CBT workshops, you will know that Bob does this role quite well. So please send him questions that you have and just a few guidelines to make it go smoothly. Uh, Bob will then take them, eliminate duplicates, uh, and, and be able to present them in a way that would be efficient for Professor Hinshaw. Um, but the few guidance are, um, first of all, send it through the private chat. Um, avoid personal details to the extent you possibly can because this is being recorded in their privacy issues. And to the extent that you can make it general for uh, interest for all of us, as opposed to some very, very discreet personal issue, that also will help streamline things. Uh, and um, to the extent you can, again, uh, focus your questions on the topics being addressed by Professor Hinshaw as opposed to something collateral. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will get us through efficiently and have, have everybody have a chance to get their questions answered. Uh, so with that, I want to thank Professor Hinshaw uh, for agreeing uh, to, to meet with us tonight. I'm just delighted that he is with us and look forward to his remarks. Thank you so much for a very kind introduction. I am going to share my screen, which I hope will work. Uh, everybody can see that, right? So I'm going to talk uh, about ADHD for a while tonight, which is a topic that I've been studying uh, throughout my career. Doesn't seem like the world's most serious mental health condition. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether ADHD exists and to what extent it does, but as we'll discuss, uh, it's real, it is controversial, uh, we have the world's largest sample of girls with ADHD in the world that we've now followed for 25 years into their 30s, um, and we'll talk about some of the outcomes that, that these uh, that these young women have experienced in their lives. And it might get you thinking a bit differently about um, a whole range of things, anxiety, ADHD, mild PTSD, the things you don't think about as the most serious of mental health concerns, but they certainly can be. And then I'll conclude that part of the talk uh, by discussing why people with ADHD, especially girls and women, receive so much stigma. And that'll get us into my concluding uh, comments on stigma, where I'll get um, a little bit into some of the chalk talk and a little bit into that personal and family experience uh, that I spoke with you all about um, six years ago in 2017. So I received a number of grants from the National Institutes of Health, uh, currently funded by the Charles Schwab Foundation for a UC, SF, UC Berkeley Schwab Dyslexia and Cognitive Diversity Center and uh, royalties from the various books I've written. So I kind of went through the agenda. So what is ADHD? We're all on a continuum. There's no form of mental disorder. I, I mean, I learned in grad school in the dark ages that you either had autism or you didn't. You had bipolar disorder, you didn't. What do you call it today? We call it the autism spectrum disorders. We talk about the... The bipolar spectrum, bipolar one, bipolar two, cyclothymia, schizophrenia spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. And ADHD, uh, some of you out there are pretty meticulous and some are kind of not too organized. And some of you are calm and reflective and some of you just say whatever comes into your mind quickly. And so the symptom dimensions that we're talking about are inattention and disorganization on the one hand and impulsive and frankly hyperactive, but in the case of girls and women, often hyperverbal behaviors on the other. And if you've got a lot of those symptoms uh, per your age, and those symptoms cause you a lot of problems, well, you might be a candidate for a diagnosis of ADHD. If we had a long time, we'd talk about something called heritability 
which everybody's heard about, but not enough people understand. So uh, you, are you again, are you meticulous or a little bit sloppy? Uh, wherever you are on that continuum, how much of that is genetic and how much is the environment you grew up in? It's a trick question. It's 100% of both. Any trait you have is entirely determined by both your genes and the environments you grew up in and the environments you created. But a legitimate question is, why are some people pretty meticulous and other people not so organized at all? Are those differences mainly the product of genes, mainly the product of experience, or kind of 50-50? So I'm gonna take a while to get started, but we're gonna come back to these concepts. Let's talk about coronary artery disease, which isn't the topic of tonight's talk. What is coronary artery disease? The arteries that feed your heart get plaques, and the plaques build up, and you get blockage. of blood can't flow to your heart, and you have a heart attack. You have an MI. What's the heritability of coronary artery disease? Not saying... If you have it, what part's genetic, what's environmental? You can't separate them. But why do some people have high risk for coronary artery disease and other people don't? Heritability is a percentage. 100% means all the risk is carried by your genes. 0% all the risk is carried by context and settings and environments. And 50% is half and half. The heritability of coronary artery disease is 0.50. There's families that have a lot of coronary artery disease. But in other families where there's not, it's not passed along genetically, diet, exercise, early exposure to air pollution and other toxins may contribute to risk. It's interesting, it's about half, half and half. What's the heritability of depression? 30% in men and 40% in women. Kind of interesting. That's significant. Genes play a role, but over the whole population, how you're raised and how you grow up in the setting and the social class you're in, they have actually more to do with it. What's the heritability of bipolar disorder, where you not only have serious depressions, but you've got either hypomanias, bipolar two, or, or full manias, bipolar one? 85%. Bipolar disorder is a genetic condition. The vast majority of the risk is conveyed by different genes across people. What's the heritability of autism spectrum disorders? 90%. Despite the theories about vaccinations and stuff, which are just simply not true, ADH, I mean, autism spectrum disorder is highly heritable. What's the heritability of ADHD? 75 to 80%. It's more heritable than coronary artery disease or depression. Everybody knows that ADHD is caused by poor parenting and bad schools and well, they might contribute, but that's they're not the main cause. Genes play the major role in who has ADHD and who doesn't, or over on the spectrum you like. But don't make the mistake of thinking that because something's really heritable, well, the only thing we could do is replace genes, which you can't do except in single gene disorders or give medications. Very, very heritable conditions can be modified through environment. PKU, phenylketonuria, it's a single gene, double recessive, and you're born a PKU baby, you know, with a heel prick, you get the blood sample when the baby's just born. You get it by mom's being a carrier, and dad's being a carrier, and you get the double recessive, like good old Mendel's peas, wrinkled and smooth peas in high school biology. All of the risk for PKU is contributed by a single gene. And how do we treat it? by taking phenylalanine out of your diet. If you don't do that, the average kid with PKU grows up with an IQ in the mild to moderate range of intellectual disability. If you control that diet from early on, most kids with PKU have an IQ of 100. Completely heritable, but if we find the right environment, we can prevent symptoms. So it kind of, that, this is the theme here. Genes matter a lot, but we don't want to get fatal about it. Fatal is say, well, what you inherit, that's your destiny. We can change things that are very, very genetic if we, if we know the right pathways to do it.
So I'm going to start us off about some of the controversy about ADHD. And I'm going to do it through, through so, showing you some ads for ADHD meds over the last 20 years. Now, I don't work for pharma. I don't get paid. To do, I'm not trying to sell you meds. This is called fair use. I can show these ads and we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit. Now, the ads I'm going to show you come from Ladies Home Journal and TV Guide. They're direct to consumer. How many countries allow medications to be advertised directly to consumers uh, as opposed to only in medical journals? Two, New Zealand and the US. In every other country, it's forbidden. And the idea was, if we show these ads directly to consumers, it'll reduce stigma. Everybody talks about it and it'll reduce prices. It's competition. Well, it doesn't reduce prices at all, which we can talk about later, but it's a big question. Do seeing ads for Abilify encourage people to speak up about their bipolar disorder? Or does it convince people who really don't have it to think they do and go shop for doctors to get the medications? Here's our ads. This came out for Concerta 22 years ago. Concerta is regular old Ritalin, which is methyl, the trade name for methylphenidate, but it's in a little space age capsule that squirts it out over 10 to 12 hours. Now, if you take a Ritalin pill, uh, it's, it's out of your system before noon if you're a school kid. Got to take another dose. This is a dose that lasts, one dose lasts all day. So back in 2001 and two, when this ad came out, this is the stereotype. ADHD is a white middle class thing. We now know that ADHD is completely equal opportunity. All races, all ethnic groups, all social classes. But the stereotype is here's a smiling white mother and white middle class. He's got his teeth in, so he's probably nine or so kid. And she says, if I give Jason his concerta, I don't see those annoying symptoms. I see the real wonderful boy he is. So if you think about it, the message is, if you give medication to your kid with ADHD, you've removed the stigma. You see the real person underneath. Now, whether or not that's true is a philosophical and scientific question for the ages. But the point is, it's a very powerful message. Here's our next ad. This came out a few years later for Adderall XR Extended Release, another way of making Adderall, which is a form of dextroamphetamine, last all day rather than have to take two or three times. And who's the market here? The fastest growing market for ADHD in the world, adults. I learned in grad school that ADHD stopped when you hit puberty. What was it called ADHD then? It was called hyperactivity or hyperkinesis. Wrong people once they hit adolescence, may not run around a classroom the way they did, but their poor executive functions and disorganization, and they persist, it may even get worse with time. So what does this ad say? Well, you've got good eyes, right? If you have ADHD and you're an adult, you're about twice as likely to get divorced as anybody else. So the message is take your Adderall XR and stay married. And if you've got really good eyes, you can read the citations. Um, if you have ADHD as an adult, you're a third more likely than anybody else to have major depression. Well, I don't want to get depressed. I better take my medication. Again, way too simplistic, but the powerful message. The fastest growing market for ADHD meds is women who didn't get diagnosed because they're older than girls. And of course, girls didn't get ADHD. It's only a boy thing. For That's all I learned basically in grad school too. Um, and the market share is just going way up. So here's our third ad. This is Shane Victorino. This ad came out about 2015, who was the first Hawaiian American to play Major League Baseball. If you're a baseball fan, you remember Shane. And he was an outfielder. He won a World Series ring with the Red Sox and then with the Phillies. And he was a top 10 home run hitter. And the ad got cut off a little bit here because it's so many megs in the, in the slide. I didn't outgrow my ADHD, Shane says. That's why I'm telling my story. So two pharmaceutical firms and Chad and Ada put together funds for this campaign. We're going to reduce the stigma. If a handsome pro athlete has ADHD, well, anybody else can talk about it. And there, there's other, I mean, his beautiful wife and kids and they're at a swimming pool. And it's wonderful. But there's another reason why Shane told his story. 
if he was caught taking Concerta or Adderall during the season, he'd be thrown out for 81 games, half a season. It's a performance enhancer. Anybody who takes a stimulant, their reaction time improves a little bit. Stay up a little bit later. So he got an exemption. Because he has bona fide ADHD, he can take stimulants. Now, the last time I checked, twice as many Major League Baseball athletes had ADHD exemptions for meds uh, than NBA, NHL, or NFL. Which leads to two possible conclusions. Number one, it's a fascinating epidemiological fact. Baseball is a sport for people with ADHD. Number two, a simpler answer is, baseball is simply the world's most boring sport ever created by human beings. Especially before they sped up the game this season, 10th inning, it's four hours, there's commercials, and that hanging curve, if you're not alert in the 10th inning, you team lose you. Track down that sinking liner in right field. So this is part of the controversy. Maybe a lot of adults claim they have ADHD to get stimulants as performance enhancer. And, and in fact, some neuropsychologists write articles that say about 25% of adults who go in for ADHD assessments don't have ADHD. They want stimulants, either to do better in their relationships or job or to sell to other people. And the big controversy there is if you don't have ADHD and you're an adult and you take stimulants, you don't learn any better. You think you do. And you're at high risk for becoming addicted. Interestingly, people with true ADHD are at very low risk for getting addicted to ADHD meds. So you can see the controversy already, right? So you need a bunch of inattentive and dis disorganized symptoms. You need a bunch of hyperactive impulsive symptoms, pointing out that for girls and women, that doesn't just mean running around a room. It means talking a lot and interrupting a lot and not being able to kind of stop that flow. And the symptoms have to cause problems. They have to be present at home and school or the peer group or the workplace. And they've got to be present since before you're 12. Note that that's a big problem for diagnosing girls. That's going to lead to underdiagnosis of girls. And to do a good assessment of ADHD does not happen in a 15 minute visit with your pediatrician, if it's your kid or with your GP if you're an adult. But that's that's what happened. The majority of people in the US diagnosed with ADHD, it's 12 to 15 minutes with their general doctor. No testing, no history, no rating scales from kids themselves and from adults and from parents and teachers, no rule out of trauma. So a big problem is we don't have time to talk about tonight. ADHD is incredibly about the same prevalence around the world, except in some subsistence cultures where there's not even compulsory education. Five to 6% of kids in the world get a valid diagnosis of ADHD and about half that many adults because some people do grow out of it, but not as many as we think. So um, it takes a long time to get a good diagnosis. And when we don't, like in the United States, what's the diagnostic prevalence of ADHD in America now? About 11%. It's about double the world average. What other countries that high? Israel. Very performance-oriented, academically motivated cultures. Which again, if we, during question and answer, we can talk about some studies we've done to show that those states and regions that really prioritize test scores above all else get more kids diagnosed with ADHD. Not that the kids really have it, but there's pressure from the schools to get them diagnosed. ADHD doesn't, it's a guy thing. Autism's a guy thing. Tourette's is a guy thing. Well, all neurodevelopmental conditions, autism spectrum, ADHD, Tourette's, very early onset conduct disorder, some forms of learning disorder, they're more prevalent in boys than girls. Is true. Why? Well, it's a very long story, but the short version is, if you um, are conceived and you have an XY, so you're biological male, what happens when you're an embryo and then fetus? Well, right in between being an embryo and a fetus, a few weeks into gestation, 
What does that Y chromosome do? The Y chromosome is a little tiny thing. There's only 45 genes on it. X chromosome has thousands. Little Y chromosome says, hey, you're going to be a guy. Start secreting testosterone and other androgens, which is what makes you a guy. What does testosterone and other androgens do when you're in utero? It slows your brain development. For the first couple, three, four years of life, girls are more empathic than boys. They're uh, mo much more verbal than boys. Go to any preschool and hear the girls having full conversations and a, a, an occasional boy grunts a few syllables and interrupts their conversation. And, you know, I'm being facetious, but having an XY configuration predicts slower brain development. Now, guys catch up. But it's little wonder that, and, and, and girls are more empathic than boys early on too. Disorders of empathy like autism, disorders of attention and regulation like ADHD, disorders of conduct, they're more prevalent guys. But it's not 20 to one the way I learned. Occasionally you'll find a girl with autism or ADHD. It's about, uh, for autism, three to one boy to girl and for ADHD about two and a half to one. And that's the, if you do a careful diagnosis. So why has it taken so long for everybody to recognize that girls really do have ADHD? Well, here's our top 10 list. Number one, this isn't just about ADHD. This is true in basic animal physiology. My colleagues at Berkeley, Irv Zucker and animal, Annalise Beery, published a paper over 10 years ago. It's been replicated now. Go to all the world's literature on animal physiology. 30% of the studies study males only. 8% study females only. And the rest, 62%, whatever's left, study both. But of course, remember, females in mammals, mammalian species, they have these things called gestation, before gestation, puberty, and, and, and then hormone switches. And so females were deemed to be unfit for scientific research because girls' physiology, <laughs> not girls, and female animals was, was deemed too unstable to study. And 30 years ago, NIH said, if you're going to write a grant, you better include both males and females. And if you don't have a good reason why you don't, uh, we're not going to fund you. So it's been a longstanding bias. Males are the standard. Females are kind of an afterthought. Second, well, if everybody believed that hyperkinesis, as it used to be called, or ADHD exists only in boys, then we don't diagnose it in girls. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Number eight, a lot of kids with ADHD can be ornery and have oppositional defiant disorder. A lot of kids with ADHD can be pretty anxious. It's called comorbidity. Well, in a boy, we say, well, look, the boy's got ADHD and he's oppositional and he's suppressed. In a girl, the anxiety and depression, well, that's all the clinician sees because girls can't have ADHD. So the other condition always takes, takes the center stage. So what did we used to call this thing we call ADHD, hyperactivity, hyperkinesis. You move around too much. And only in 1980, DSM-3, did people start saying it's really an attention deficit disorder. Hyperactivity may or not be part of it. So now we call it ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, just to confuse everybody. Because you could have ADHD and not have hyperactivity. You could have only the inattentive. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm glad I wasn't associated with naming it. But the point is, everybody used to think of ADHD as a boy thing because you're just moving too much. Number six, how did you get any kid in the United States into a research study on ADHD in the olden days? Well, you gave something called the Connors. Connors, Keith Connors, former colleague of mine, Duke University, passed away a few years ago. He made these long rating scales, but then the 10 items on those scales that had the highest kind of um, sensitivity for ADHD, that was his screener. Eight of the 10 items were acts as if driven by a motor, restless in the squirmy sense, restless, always up and on the go, talks too much. They were all about hyperactivity, not inattention. So the whole field was biased because we had the wrong criteria to get people into research studies. 
Okay, this is you, you got to get your bend bend your head around this one a little bit. Let's go into any classroom, whether kids have ADHD or not, and you put observers in, and they're just coding every few seconds kids' behavior. What do the observers find? Boys are pretty much everywhere more hyperactive and impulsive than girls, but inattention is kind of equal opportunity. But the teachers of those same kids in the same classroom, at the end of the month, they do ratings, and they say the boys are higher on both. How do you diagnose a kid with ADHD? You get teacher ratings. Teachers impute, suppose that because the boys are more hyperactive, they're also more inattentive, but objectively they're not. So there's bias even in the diagnostic system. Number four used to be that you couldn't get an ADHD diagnosis before first grade, essentially, and to be six or under. Well, that's going to pluck out only the boys who were running around the classroom. And DSM-5, 2013, 10 years ago. No, it's before 12. Because maybe some kids who are more purely inattentive aren't going to be as noticeable. But even this is a problem because many girls don't show these um symptoms at clinical levels until they're older than 12. Number three, as our research has found in many other people's research, not that many, because still people aren't doing enough research on girls. Stereotypically, a girl wants to do better in school than most boys do. She's going to push herself. I can't be a failure. And the parents are going to stay up late with her and do homework and get tutors and all kinds of stuff if they can afford it. And many girls who don't get diagnosed till later, they clearly had ADHD in grade school, but the coping and the compensation and this perfectionism and anxiety have really kind of made it less visible. Number two, across the lifespan, puberty is a different experience for a gal than it is for a guy. And guess what? Guys uh, don't give birth. And guess what? Guys don't really go through perimenopause or menopause. And all of these research is finding for neurotypical people, and especially people with ADHD, these developmental changes can really exacerbate the underlying symptoms. But if we don't think ADHD exists in girls, then we don't look for it. And the big research gap now is for uh, sexually more minoritized youth, uh, LGBTQ youth, um, we just, we don't have enough data. And then the final thing we won't spend any time on is maybe we should just then diagnose girls with ADHD if they're more inattentive and impulsive than other girls, not compared to the general pool, but that might overdiagnose. So we're not going to dwell on that right now. So it's so about 2.3, 2.4, 2 2.5 to 1. There are more boys and girls, but girls have been, I mean, literally, I learned in grad school, it was 10 to 20 to 1. So girls have been overlooked for way too long. The mass general studies, Joe Biederman studies, uh, which we don't have time to get into, looked at the, uh, the, the, the then largest sample of girls with ADHD in the world, 140 of them, uh, and the girls remained with a lot of ADHD symptoms and a lot of comorbidities uh, into their teens and 20s. Our own study started in the 90s. The B gals, the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study, because you have to have an acronym. We wrote to the NIMH uh, back in the late 90s. No, the early, I'm sorry, the early 90s, and said, I was bold. I said, we want to study girls with ADHD. And NIMH said, well, well that's not, why would you do that? And then looked up every study ever done and said, it's really, really important. They said, oh, yeah, it's a really good idea. In fact, it got the top, it was the top ranked grant, grant out of NIMH in late 1994. So, you know, people were starting to believe, well, maybe we should do the study. So we ran our summer camps, about half girls with ADHD, about half girls neurotypical controls, uh, found out a lot of stuff about their behavior patterns and were successful in getting a grant five years later and five years later and six years later. And now we're in our fifth wave where every participant is now in her 30s. So we've been very fortunate and very dogged. Uh, we've 
got most of the sample back each time because we we never let up and because the girls got a six week summer camp and we advocate, et cetera, et cetera. And we're finishing up our fifth wave. We won't get 90%, uh, but we'll get in the 80s, we hope. What do you do in a longitudinal study, a lifespan study? If you want to measure change, don't change the measure. So we use the same items to measure inattention and impulsivity and hyperactivity and anxiety and conduct problems, because otherwise you're comparing apples with oranges. But you also have to add new measures as a sample ages. So we pruned out some of the measures that didn't help that much and started to at our third wave when the, 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 the girls, now young women, were 19, 20, 21, et cetera. And ever since, we've studied self-harm. That's the umbrella. If your intent is to end your life, that's suicidal behavior, either the intention or a plan or a, an actual attempt on your life, versus this form that everybody's talking about these days, NSSI, non-suicide, cutting, burning, self-mutilation. So when you talk to kids and young adults and even older adults who engage in it, they don't want to die, but they've got this intense psychological pain. And maybe if I bleed or I physically cause pain, it might take away the psychological stress and pain for at least the time being. We'll talk about our statistics in a minute, but the recent data came out from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For kids, especially girls who engage in non-suicidal self-injury, What's the average age of onset today in the United States? 11 and a half and 12, with many uh, starting before the age of 10. So imagine a second grader uh, cutting herself till she bleeds or burning herself or you know, pulling her hair out in clumps, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's shocking, but it's, it's somewhat contagious because when some girl in the middle school does it, others tend to copy but then it's a pretty deeply emotionally dysregulated set of behaviors. Now, after our third wave, we published these findings and they made a lot of press uh, back in 2012. So we brought the girls into these summer camps. We got a comparison group built in. If you came into the summer camp with a diagnosis of ADHD combined, that means a combination of inattention and impulsive hyperactive behaviors. 23% had made a serious attempt in their lives with so the age of 20. 8% of our purely inattentive girls, now young women, and 6% of our neurotypicals. 6%, that's the national average. This isn't some Bay Area fluke. In terms of, so NSSI, I mean, if I pull at my cuticles, that's the mild this form of not suicidal self-injury, but we're talking about moderate to severe, cutting, uh, banging your head against a hard object till you bruise, uh, burning yourself. 51% of the girls with early combined ADHD when they were before 12 were engaged in moderate to severe, a uh, little over a quarter of the inattentive and 19% of our neurotypical comparisons. 19%, that was the national average in 2012. And today it's higher. If you don't believe there's a mental health crisis, just read what the Surgeon General, Dr. Mur Murthy said six months ago. It is an unparalleled crisis. 30% of high school girls in the United States today have seriously considered suicide, which is up threefold from 10 years ago. And the suicide, it, it, causes of death for girls and young women aged 10 to 24, the number two cause of death is suicide. It's it's an epidemic, it's, it's, it's just horrible. And ADHD is a risk factor for this. So we're gonna test your, um, fast processing skills and teach you about mediation analysis. So we've got these girls who were in grade school, came to our summer camps. 
and they have ADHD or they don't, or we could do it on a continuum. It doesn't matter. And 10 years later, we got a measure of how severely they're self-injuring. But we had a second wave when they you saw the slide a few slides ago, when they're about 14, 15, 16, they're in middle school or early high school. That's a mediator. What happens in between the thing, the, the predictor, ADHD, and the outcome, NSSI severity? Well, the thing that explained it was something called the cancel underlying task. It's an executive function measure. It's a measure of how well you can restrain your impulses to do something. And the parents and teachers reports of the girl's aggression for externalizing behaviors. Okay, keep that in your mind. And we're going to go to the next slide. Looks like the same thing, but it's now we've changed the outcome. Same predictor, ADHD, either you got it or you don't, or you got a lot of it or not so much of it. And now the outcome is, have you made a serious suicide attempt? What was the adolescent process that explained that? The girls and the parents and the teachers average scores of the girls' depression and anxiety and social withdrawal. So predicting NSSI cutting and burning is acting out in poor response inhibition. Predicting her attempted suicide is her adolescent anxiety, depression, social isolation. So that was Erica Swanson's dissertation. Jocelyn Mesa in our lab did the same kind of thing, but she was very interested in peer relationships. So again, on the left, it's, it's, a, it's a neuropsych measure, but it could be ADHD symptoms or the, don't worry about that. And we're predicting again to NSSI severity 10 years later. The thing that explained that in middle school and early high school was the girl's perception of how much her peers physically and relationally bullied her, how much she was victimized. But the predictor of attempted suicide was the teacher's report of how much other girls ignored and disliked her, low social preference. So we're finding a pattern. The experience of being victimized is a potent predictor of this engagement in NSSI. But an outsider, the teacher's perspective on who's getting shunned and ignored, that's a potent predictor of attempted suicide. And I'm, I got way too many slides, so we're gonna go kind of quick. Maya Gundelman's master's thesis around this time provided us something that no one had ever seen before in the world of ADHD. So our girls with ADHD were a lot more likely to attempt suicide than our neurotypical comparison group, right? Same neighborhood, same age, same ethnicity. But some of the girls with ADHD, we learned through blinded coding of all their records and charts, had received physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect in their first 12 years of life. Matched on everything else, if you're a girl with ADHD who had not been maltreated, who had not received physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect, one in seven, 14% chance of attempted suicide by age 20. If you had experienced one or more of those forms of maltreatment, over one in three. That's a 2.4 relative risk, if you know what those terms mean. But wait a minute, ADHD is 75 to 80% heritable. It's all about the genes. No, the genetic risk kind of loads the gun and maltreatment pulls the trigger. Experience adds on to genetic vulnerability. This is true for bipolar disorder, which is ex even more heritable than ADHD, 85% in studies of thousands of veterans, thousands in their sample sizes and other studies. If you've been maltreated as a kid, and you have the genetic risk for or have bipolar disorder, you're 50% more likely to attempt suicide than if you have bipolar disorder of the genes, but without that maltreatment. My mission in life is to get people, scientists, students, you all, the general public, to stop thinking that it's either all in the brain and you're in your genes, or it's all in the environment. It's a combination of both. We're gonna skip a couple. Oh, here's a statistic for you. By the fourth wave, when the B gals are now in their late 20s on average, and the neurotypicals, about 10.5% had had one or more unplanned pregnancies and 43.5% of the girls with ADHD. That's a big difference. 
Also, if you go, um, it may not be on this slide, I may have cut it somewhere else. The girls with ADHD were three times more likely by late adolescence, early adulthood to be the uh, victims of sexual violence by guys. So there's something about, it's called heterotypic continuity. Early ADHD predicted later ADHD in these girls, but because of the internalization and because of things like maltreatment, and because it's harder to have ADHD if you're a girl than a guy, because you don't, a lot of guys are kind of impulsive and ornery, but for girl, that's, that's not the way you're supposed to behave. The long-term outcomes are devastating if you don't get early treatment. So we talked about this, we talked about this. Do the treatments work differently for guys and gals with ADHD? Not really except that in the biggest review done by Coke et al. a couple of years back, there's stimulant medications, work on dopamine for ADHD, and there's non-stimulants. Gals overall have more side effects to stimulants, and they show on average, it's not a huge effect, but it's, a, it's significant, they may do better. You might want to try a gal or a woman, you know, a girl or a woman on a non-stimulant if you're not having an initial good response to the stimulant meds. So that's girls in ADHD. We'll, we'll come back to them in stigma in a minute, but first we have to define stigma. It's an ugly word. Say it to yourself. Say it out loud when the meeting's over. The fricative stick in your throat. Stigma. What does it mean literally? It's a term from ancient, actually ancient Greek and Latin. And it literally is the burn marks that were branded in you or the metal rods that were heated to put the brand in you. So a stigma is a branding. Most stigma today isn't a physical branding. Now, back in ancient Athens, as I'm sort of fond of saying, you know, I'm at the Agora, I'm at the marketplace. Agoraphobia literally means a fear of the marketplace, fear of being outside or enclosed, right? How do I know that my fellow shopper didn't actually fight for Sparta or it wasn't a former slave? Well, I wouldn't know, except underneath their toga on their shoulder, they had a brand. Everybody knew the stigma was imposed by the government. So you keep away from the misfits. Is there physical stigma today? What if you're in a concentration camp in Germany or Poland, 30s or 40s? You either had tattooed or branded into your left wrist numbers. There's a physical stigma. In several African countries in the 80s, the most stigmatized disease on earth was HIV AIDS, and people were physically branded, so everybody knew to stay away. But most stigma today, we don't brand physically. We know about, well, look at the groups in the middle of the slide. I put left-handed, the left-handedness. My little sister back in Ohio all those years ago my grandmother didn't want Sally to be left-handed. She tried everything. Left-handedness, you know, sinister from Latin. It's bad. You're evil. What about left-handedness today? If you're one of the 10 and a half to 11 percent, you probably have good spatial abilities. You might get into MIT. It's awesome. So you think, well, that's a trivial example, but no. Sometimes as cultures change and as norms and mores change, formerly stigmatized attributes are not stigmatized or even revered. Who are the most stigmatized people in the United States today? People with mental illnesses, people who are homeless or unhoused, is probably a better term, or people who abuse drugs. They're the bottom three. Just to jump into another slide before we get to it, do we know more in 2023 about mental illness and substance abuse than we did in the 50s? Oh, yeah. High school psychology courses. You know, it's in the popular media all the time. How have attitudes changed in turn? No different. Stigma is exactly the same today as it was in the 50s, except that three times more people in the United States today, if they hear the term mental illness, immediately think of danger and aggression and violence compared to 1955. So in some ways, we're going back. Is that because of deinstitutionalization and because of the association with homelessness? And we could talk a long time about that. 
what composes stigma? This would, I mean, I spend half a course talking about this. Well, we all stereotype. We're kind of programmed. I mean, if I didn't notice difference between people walking around the Berkeley campus, well, most people aren't as old as I, thank God, but who wears glasses and who doesn't? And what's their skin color? I mean, we all stereotype. But what if that stereotype is negatively tinged? Now it's prejudice, literally prejudgment. And as I often say, you know, I'm a very progressive Berkeley professor. I've never had prejudice against anyone except Stanford. They're, they're private. They wear red. They don't wear blue. They're elite. Now, everything I say is true. But you heard my tone of voice. I didn't just stereotype Stanford. I have prejudice. And no Stanford student is ever going to take my class for credit. I'm going to discriminate. What does stigma mean? Stigma means it's the sum of stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Plus, if I stereotype you because of the group you're in, you're just, you're just part of that group. You've lost your individuality. You may have even lost your humanity. And what throughout history has been the sentence, if you will, for highly stigmatized group? Extermination. Think of Hitler in the camps. Was it just Jewish people? Was it just Roma? Gay and lesbian people, people with feeble-mindedness, what we call today intellectual disability, and people with mental illness. Weren't fit to be in society. Vermin, beneath human. So stigma is a very powerful concept. I wrote a book on this topic 15 years ago. We need a second edition. I'm asking for volunteers to help me with it. No, I don't have time. But anyway, it, would be, it needs to be updated. And just for anybody who's interested in art, um, I chose for the cover art, for the Mark of Shame, Stigma of Mentalism, and Agenda for Change, Oxford U Press. This is the middle of a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, the phantasmagoric Flemish Dutch painter. It's hanging in the Prado, painted in 1496. What's happening? The surgeon is taking a rock out of the gentleman's head because the cause of mental illness in Amsterdam in 1496 was thought to be a stone in your head. So the surgeon, but wait a minute, the surgeon's wearing a wizard hat. So we know we're in trouble already. Bosch is toying with us. See, a surgeon or a wizard is removing the stone. The priest with the chalice is giving a blessing. The poor patient is giving us like, what is going on? But I think the slide's clear enough. See what's coming out of the trefined hole in the patient's head? It's not a rock. There's three or four little tufts. Bosch was painting the removal of a flower from the patient's head. Why? What was the name for mental illness in Holland in 1496? You were a tulip head. I mean, tulips were the main source of commerce, but they're still a huge source of commerce for the Netherlands today. So Bosch, 520 whatever years ago, some years ago, is saying, if you remove the tulipness, if you remove the diagnosis, is that liberating? Or does the tulipness, does the autism, does the ADHD, does the schizophrenia, does the diagnosis help you get treatment? And he left it a mystery, and it's in some ways still a mystery today, all these years later. If society stigmatizes you because of the group you're in, it's likely, not inevitable, but you may, if back in the day, you heard the campfire stories today, you're on social media, you know what people think of you and your group. So there's a tendency for you to internalize your self-stigma. I guess I really am like all those other unhoused people, all those other, quote, schizophrenics or bipolars or, you know, all the derogatory terms, ADHDers. What is likely if you show high self-stigma? You don't seek treatment because you really don't deserve it or you drop out early. Now, of course, there's structural issues. We don't really have a health insurance system in our country still. Um, treatment access is very checkered, et cetera, et cetera. But self-stigma is a potent predictor of not getting engaged in treatment, which leads to a vicious cycle. And then there's this interesting term called courtesy stigma. Irving Goffman was a sociologist. He wrote in 1963. Um, we're at the 60th anniversary of his book called Stigma, Notes on the Development of a Spoiled Identity. And it's a little paperback. It's like the Bible of stigma. He, he didn't even know what a statistic was or what evolution was, but and he anticipated all the subsequent studies and all what the evolutionary psychologists say. 
it's a classic little book. You can buy it for 50 cents on Amazon. Somebody's, you know, undergraduate's dog-eared copy from, you know, their undergrad days. He said, if society bothers to stigmatize you or your group, it's only common courtesy to stigmatize anybody associated with you or your group. I mean, he was being totally, you know, sarcastic. Like your family. And of course, what a dovetailing. What did we know was the cause of autism for most of the 20th century? Refrigerator parents. Parents so cold and aloof that your kid couldn't even form an attachment bond to you. How did you get schizophrenia? You had a schizophrenogenic mother, cold, aloof, hostile, demanding. You had to withdraw into your own reality because you couldn't become a full person. Abuse and trauma are contributors. Parenting is very important for treatment for kids. But parents got a bad rap of being blamed for stuff that was highly heritable conditions. Who else receives courtesy stigma? I do. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work with crazy people. I work with kids who don't learn very well, who aren't very regulated. Right? Psychiatrists work with people who used to be in mental hospitals and other stigmatized, you know, kind of institution. What's the number one source of stigma as reported by adults in large samples with schizophrenia, severe depression, or bipolar disorder. They're providers. Never thought I'd go finish school. Never believed I could hold a job. Low expectations all the way to Gomer. You know Gomer, right? Get out of my emergency room, G-O-M-E-R. Emergency room docs. You know, I, I'm dealing with gunshot victims or, you know, people had a stroke. People who uh, put drugs in their system or are hallucinating, uh, uh, crazy people don't belong in my emergency. I want real patients in my emergency room. Countless people back in the day. It's not so much used now. Courtesy stigma means that we as professionals, we supporting people with forms of mental illness, have to watch our own attitudes because we've been socialized in the same culture that everybody else has. I said this already. Is mental illness stigma going down? No. Except the first ray of light came out late 2021, January 22, and JAMA Network opened the journal. Bernice Pesco Salido, my friend and colleague, um, who's a sociologist at Indiana University, she runs the National Stigma Study, where every few years, random, it's like the census, so it's only on, you know, kind of odd years. Um, questions about social determinants of health and all that kind of, and, and stigma. Between 2009 and 2019, for the first time in US history, random sample of Americans were much more likely to not reject, to show less, they showed less stigma towards people with depression in a vignette. First sign. However, in the exact same study, stigma towards schizophrenia had gone up and schiz a, a, a stigma toward addiction had gone up. So it's a mixed blessing. Maybe athletes, Simone Biles, right? Michael Phelps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Naomi Osaka, who just was interviewed during the US Open a couple of weeks ago. Maybe depression, it's okay to talk about it more. These findings from Pesco Salido et al., if you do, if you, you know, chop up the data, what's it driven by? People under 30. Young people are driving authenticity and acceptance. You know, people my age with my hair color, we got a long way to go. But it's 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 only for depression so far. Schizophrenia, marked by psychosis, very threatening. Addiction, substance use. Well, you, know, you chose to put that stuff in your system, attribution of personal control, actually getting worse. So we've got a long way to go. But wait. Every theorist will tell you there is a lot of stigma about schizophrenia. People are irrational, hear voices, have strange beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. This, I mean, HIV back in the day was a lot more stigmatized than the flu. And then we get COVID. How stigmatized was that? You know, the world's changing. Why would ADHD receive a lot of stigma? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I didn't have time to get into it. But what's the biggest finding 
if you do neuropsychological research, you give people with ADHD all sorts of tests of their response inhibition and their persistence and their planning and their working memory. What's the biggest finding? Which area of uh, cognition has the biggest impairment? It's a trick question. The biggest finding is that no matter what the test is, people with ADHD are consistently inconsistent. Right on a couple of trials, they're wrong. And ADHD is a condition marked by maybe at the level of a brain functioning, something's interfering with your consistent focus. It's a it's misnamed. It's not an attention deficit disorder. Many people with ADHD have hyper focus. They can't get off their interested topic for 10 hours. It's a disorder of the regulation of attention when things shift. But what about a condition in which people are inconsistent? What do we think? If you only tried harder, I mean, you did okay in practice. What happened goalie in the soccer game? You look interested in Clover and the winning goal goes by your ear. Or you did fine in history. What about algebra? When things are thought to be under a person's control, even less severe, quote, condition, even though I just talked about girls and women with ADHD, the outcomes can be particularly severe, but not as overtly severe uh, as, as say, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, we make the attribution that you could have done it, you should have done it, we, we know you could control it. And what about if you're a girl or woman with ADHD? Well, girls and women are supposed to be social. And you interrupt all the time? And you can't stop talking? And you don't do as well in school? I mean, you're smart enough, but you just, you, you can't remember the homework instructions, et cetera, et cetera. So, Females with ADHD may have the double whammy or triple whammy, especially if you're in a minoritized group, of being expected to do something, but you don't perform consistently, um, and the societal stigma and the self-stigma uh, multiply. So we're going to finish with some talk about stigma from a different level. It's what I focused on six years ago when this book came out. The book's called Another Kind of Madness. This is my father the uh, professor of philosophy at Ohio State, Virgil Hinshaw Jr., and me a long time ago when I was 18, um, had the mustache back then and uh, had it for a while until my wife said some, you know, didn't meet her then, but years later, at some point she said, you know, Steve, the 70s ended a long time ago. So I took the hint, okay? So I shaved the mustache off. But this photo taken by my mom in the backyard in Columbus, across the river from Ohio State, where dad and mom uh, both taught, was two months after my first spring break from being in college back east. I came home for spring break thinking, well, I can't wait to get back to Cambridge, Mass. And dad pulled me aside and said, son, it's probably time that you learned about why I was gone so much when you were young. And I had never known. I knew that dad would be gone for three months, six months, or at one point, a year at a time, and never got a postcard or phone call. My mom wasn't allowed to talk. I didn't know she wasn't allowed to talk about it. Dad was in some of the country's worst mental hospitals. He had classic severe bipolar disorder, misdiagnosed as schizophrenia from age 16 to 56, which is very common. Nobody believed in bipolar disorder diagnosis in the US until about 1970 when lithium finally got approved. So as a boy, when dad was home, it was great, but then he'd be gone and gone and gone, and I didn't know what to do. It must have been my fault. What does a kid do when things are going pretty wrong, but nobody talks about it? There's two choices. I mean, I'm being simplistic. I guess, A, you can believe the world's a terrible, random, cruel place, or B, it must have been my fault. Now, it probably wasn't, but at least you have some illusion you could have controlled it. So I thought, and of course, when dad would show up, six months later by magic and be cooking breakfast. No, but no homecoming, no warning. I thought if I asked about it, maybe I'd jinx it. And so I just shut up about it until, and you know, sports and school and girls, you know, I, I distracted myself, but first spring break, I wasn't a kid anymore because his lead doctor had told him and my mom, when my little sister and I were in preschool, said, if your children ever learn of your schizophrenia, which they thought was a diagnosis, and your hospitalizations, they'll be permanently destroyed. You are never allowed to broach the topic. 
you're forbidden from talking about mental illness in the family. That was the doctor's orders. In one passage of another kind of madness, when I kind of am taking a pause from the narrative, I say, what would we say to or about the oncologist who said or says, uh, your cancer is so toxic and lethal. And if your children ever learn about it, they'll be put on the you're, you're forbidden from talking about it. We'd sue the doctor for malpractice. Families need to support. And why do I mention cancer? What did you not do? And it wasn't that long ago, 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s of last century, if your great aunt or your grandpa died of cancer. What did you put in the obituary? Died of natural causes, uh, died of an unknown illness. Cancer was really stigmatized because the psychosomatic people said cancer is uh, uh, an illness. When you've given up the will to live, the cancer cells take over. So people were stigmatized highly for having cancer. You'd never, and today it's a cause. What are the NFL dudes? One Sunday this fall, you'll see everybody with pink knee socks to fight breast cancer. What color knee socks do the NFL dudes wear to fight uh, mental health issues? Trick question. They don't. Mental health is the cancer of this century still, despite how much we know, despite the fact that most people with mental illness recover. Treatments for mental health conditions are as effective as medical treatments, psychological treatments for and medical treatments for mental health, are as effective as most physical treatments for people with physical disorders. But the stereotype is they're permanent and the person's flawed and all the, the whole rest of the, the stigmatizing thing. Dad's story had begun when he was 16 down in Pasadena where he was the fourth of four boys. His mom died when he was three. Two more half-brothers emerged. And during the 30s, he began to, in the early fall, the Santa Ana winds down in Southern California, believe that the United States was not doing enough to stop Mussolini and Hitler and the fascists. And over the course of a week, he developed the belief that, um, and he stayed up all night walking the streets of Pasadena. He's a clear manic episode, nobody knew. And he believed he'd sprouted wings. So he jumped from the roof of his family home one sunrise morning, September 6, 1936, thinking that would send a message to the world's leaders to stop the isolationism and 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 and, and combat the, the fascists. How long did his flight last? You know, 1.1 seconds. He crashed the pavement beneath. He broke his wrist. He had a concussion. And he was put in a county hospital for six months with chronic schizophrenia, where he nearly, well, he thought the Nazis had poisoned the food supply. And so he stopped eating. So he went, he was a shot putter and a football. He went from 180 to 116 pounds. And his father was called in for last rites. It's the first time the hospital superintendent had ever contacted the family. Those were the snake pit days. Dad recovered, was valedictorian at Pasadena JC, went to Stanford instead of Berkeley, had a full scholarship to Berkeley, he turned down. And that's when he was saying, never forgave him for that. That's another story. Didn't go over to fight in World War II because he was 4F. He'd been in a mental hospital or two or three by then. Um, and some they were Quakers and so conscientious objectors. And at, at getting his PhD in Princeton in philosophy, uh, he studied with Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein. You know, I thought I did well in school. My, my dad, you, know, you always compare yourself to a family member and you never do as well. But just before he finished his dissertation, fortunately, he turned it in. He thought he could predict the end of World War II via telepathy. And he was put into Byberry State Hospital, Philadelphia State, which, even though he didn't know it at the time, and I didn't know it till 20 years ago when I started researching it, had in the men's unit 7,000 men in space for 1,300. And Morton Deutsch, who wrote The Shame of the States, the 1948 expose of America's snake pits, said, uh, I was at the liberation of Buchenwald in 1945, and the only place I've ever been that resembled it was Byberry State Hospital. And then the, the actual conscientious objectors started smuggling out the photographs of the shallow graves and the starvations and beatings. 
dad thought when he was there, his older brother came to take him on a day pass one day and dad, they left the facility and dad said, I'm being held in a concentration camp in Germany. Take us back. You're, you're, you're my collaborator. We'll be shot. And, you know, I learned that from my uncle thought, well, you know, that's pretty crazy. That's delusional. And then I learned of what really happened at Byberry, and it gave me some respect that some delusions may have a kernel of truth. There may be a metaphorical truth. So dad recovered without any treatment. Six months later, he had that kind of miraculous kind of bipolar disorder where he wild manias, terrible depressions, and then kind of go back to euthymia, go back to pretty much normal. All through my childhood, he was gone, got put on... Thorazine, the fourth patient in the United States. Um, they thought he had schizophrenia. He had a lot of electroshock treatments. If lithium had been available the way it was in Europe, he could have avoided all that. Um, he was a great dad when he was around, but he wasn't around. And so when I was 18 and I had that spring break conversation with dad, guess what I did? I went back to Harvard and changed my major to psychology. I think maybe I, I I'm not sure. I, that doesn't seem like he has chronic schizophrenia. So I was dedicated to curing my dad and solving the world's mental health problems with a little bit of my own grandiosity. But I was also scared out of my mind because I thought schizophrenia is, boy, we, the, the, the Danish study, the adoption studies were out then. Schizophrenia is highly heritable, right? So I thought I'd be next. So because I didn't talk about any of this in college. Did I, did I tell my professors I was going to apply for grad school in clinical psych? No, no one would let in the son of a schizophrenic to grad school. So it wasn't until I got comfortable enough in my own skin and started reaching out and got some therapy. And then in the last half of my career, I thought, I do science, I do neuroscience, I do developmental stuff, I do cognitive stuff, ADHD stuff. But the big message is to tell your story and your narrative, to, to blend the science with the actual experience. And people say, well, how can you be an objective scientist if you, if you disclose it? If I'm doing an experiment or a longitudinal study, you know, I remain blinded. I'm not gonna let my biases come in, but that's not all of science. That's the confirmatory phase. The discovery phase of science is when you think what you're interested in. How many people in the mental health world have come into that field as scientists or clinicians or, or trainers or whatever because of family experiences? Probably a majority. How many people get into cancer medicine, oncology because of cancer history in their families? Probably a lot. And so the reason I'm telling you what I'm telling you now and do this in all my classes and in you know, I'm, I'm a professor and I'm a writer and an advocate and all that kind of stuff is because it's really important to not have happen when I was a kid. So I don't walk around the Berkeley campus, this is the last thing I'll say, with a sandwich board saying, dad had bipolar. I've had pretty severe depressions. I don't handle loss very well. If I'm going to disclose it's going to be with rehearsal and support and timing on my terms, right? And that's why support groups are so friggin' helpful. But what we can't have is what the doctor told dad and mom. You can never talk about it. It's forbidden. If we have that, we'll lose the battle with stigma. We'll lose the battle with to, to fight for mental health. Another kind of madness, the title of the book comes from, it's a quote from James Baldwin from Giovanni's Room, and my editor and I, six, seven years ago, were saying, well, what should be the title of this book? And read the Baldwin quote. And we both at the same instant said, well, stigma is another kind of madness, but it's actually worse than bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or PTSD or ADHD because it, it removes all hope. Without the stigma, we could fund NIMH at the same level as the National Cancer Institute, and we could do what NAMI does, and we could do what MHA America does. And if you don't have hope, if you're not able to disclose, the battle's lost. So I'm going to end on that note because it's not quite eight. And um, sometimes this is a heavy place to end a talk, but um, we don't have that many people. If you want to ask a question, just unmute and say it or a comment or anything.
as I get my spin drip. Mm. Uh, Dr. Henshaw, I've got a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, first question is about uh, the relationship between ADHD and some of the emotion dysregulation disorders. It's a yeah. great question. So this is one of the $64 billion questions in the ADHD world. Shouldn't, because so many people with ADHD, it's not just that they're disorganized with homework or in the workplace, but they don't control their emotions very well. Shouldn't emotion dysregulation be part and parcel of the diagnostic criteria? And some people say, yes, Russ Barkley, the ADHD guru who just retired last year said yes. And other people say, but wait, ADHD isn't just one thing. There's this combined form where you've got a lot of impulsivity and inattention. You've got the more purely inattentive form. And many people with the inattentive form don't have much emotion dysregulation at all. So it's kind of an ancillary thing. But as we learned, and some of the slides I showed you, if you're a girl with ADHD, where you're kind of behind the eight ball because girls aren't girls are expected to be social and really academic. What's how many? What's the percentage of college students in the United States today are women? Sixty-one percent. Very different from when I was in college, right? And if you if you have ADHD, it's more pronounced, as I showed you with the data, for those with impulsivity, the combined type, than purely inattention. But even inattention predicts it. If you've also had physical or emotional trauma, and you also start to internalize and blame yourself, and we didn't talk about substance use, on average, our girls in the BGAL sample, now that they're women, didn't have tons more substance use than our neurotypicals, the way most boys do. But I think the alternative pathway is girls have more of a tendency to internalize and, you know, gee, I lost that battle with perfectionism. And so emotion dysregulation may come out through the back door, if you will, through self-harm, suicidal and non-suicidal uh, behavior in the long run. So it's a tough question about whether it should be part of the diagnostic criteria or not. But, you know, for my money, any pediatrician or GP or psychologist or social worker who's assessing someone for ADHD ought to be aware of emotional dysregulation may well be part of the picture, even though it might be just beneath the surface. Thank you. Another question. This is about um, traits and ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, there's some overlap. Can you talk a bit about teasing that out? So let's let's go back to heritability that you all will either forget at eight o'clock or never forget, I hope. Heritability is high for ADHD. Must be there's an ADHD gene, wrong. What's the heritability of height? 92%. Why am I in the middle of the bell curve? Why am I not taller or shorter? Because of the damn height genes my parents gave me. Damn them. If I only were 6'3", never mind. It's another story. I've had a better basketball career. Height's very heritable. ADHD is very heritable. Does that mean we can't do anything about it? No. We can do a lot about it. So, Pin me back to your question, because I'm starting to go in a different direction. Sure. So it's traits, ADHD traits overlap with autism. So with autism. So traits. How do you tease that apart? Not only are there hundreds, if not, so height. Is there a height gene? No. We have 21,000 genes, probably 4,000 of them contribute to height by altering biochemistry a little tiny fraction of a bit. And so sum them together, it's very heritable. ADHD, there's at least a thousand genes, quote, responsible for variation and self-regulation. Autism's very heritable. And now that in the last seven, eight years, we have these international consortia where you get people from each continent giving their blood and you do genome analyses. What have we learned? There's a common set of about 150 to 200 genes that contribute to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, ADHD, and autism in common. 
these aren't autism genes or bipolar genes. They're genes that build brains. They're genes that predict neural projections, that predict neurotransmitter replenishment. And depending on early life experience, prenatal and postnatal, that's what shapes why some people develop schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, or autism, or ADHD. So it's not like, gee, all these things are pretty heritable. They must have very specific genes. No wonder men, so before DSM-3 in 2013, if you had autism, you're not allowed to get an ADHD diagnosis because everybody knew that your inattention and spaciness was because of your autism. Now that can be a comorbidity and it's real because even at a genetic level, there's common genetic vulnerability to the major mental disorder. So 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people were writing books about the bipolar gene or the gay gene and totally misguided. It's polygenic. There's many, many genes acting in combination that actually there's a shared genetic risk. And what we don't know, the brain's pretty damn complicated, how experience pre and postnatally shapes the symptom trajectories of the different conditions. So that's my answer and I'm sticking with it. It's a, it's a great answer. Okay, who else? We don't, we're running out of time. Okay, Anybody speak um, up, please. Well, just one more question sure. here. This is actually me. Um, You've talked about self-stigma and and how that affects really the, in some ways, the prognosis, the ability yes. to change it. Um, what are the best clinical treatments for self-stigma? Well, it's always good to know what it is first. So colleagues of mine, one is at San Francisco VA, Jennifer Boyd in Livingston, back in 2010, published the ISME, the Internalized Stigma of Mental Illness Scale, ISMI. And it talks about, I mean, so at a research level, how do you know it's self-stigma and just not that you're kind of depressed or anxious overall? This is very specific about low self-valuation because of the disorder you have, et cetera, et cetera. And now we can measure it pretty well. What's the antidote to self-stigma? So history, Gordon Alpert, 1954, The Nature of Prejudice. He, were, he, wasn't, he was talking about prejudice, not stigma. He said it's inevitable that anyone in a group that receives prejudice will internalize it. Well, he was wrong. There's a strong tendency. What are the main antidotes to self-stigma? Solidarity, social action, and support. Why did NAMI get created? So that families could talk with one another about their kids' experiences and not feel as isolated and not feel as ashamed. What about cancer self support groups? What about Parkinson's support? I mean, you could go on and on. If you feel a common bond with other people who share your issues, your racial state status, your psychiatric illness, and you take some power and get solidarity, those are the treatments for internalized stigma. I'm also getting better through psychotherapy, group therapy, medications, what have you, that can help too. But the real answer is through the NAMIs of the world. Come on, somebody else, be brave. <laughs> well, that's just a comment that thanking you for your emphasis on early treatment, and the need sure. for early treatment. Um, and we'll take any other questions. We've just got about three minutes, three or four minutes before we have to end up. I'll, I'll ask. Oh, go ahead, um, Susan. Are you, Susan? Do you have a question? No, I don't. Okay. I'll, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm just, just listening. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I have a. I don't know if it's a comment or a or a question, but um, as, as I mentioned at the outset, when I go out and I talk to Rotary groups and church groups and try to educate people about mental illness and, and, and stigma, I often refer to uh, the work that you've done. Uh, and uh, you know, one of, the, one of the ways I've always sort of thought about it is that mental illness is really at the bullseye of so many of our most intractable social problems. That's right. Lack of housing, yep. substance abuse. And the question I guess I have to you is, is, is gun violence. And in the incredibly hyper-partisan discussions it just strikes me as a non-professional 
that the uh, the language that's used about gun violence and the blaming of yeah. gun violence on mental illness yeah. has just set us back horribly it's, to the stigma yeah. front. So do people with mental illnesses have a proneness to aggression or violence? Overall, the answer is zero effect size. However, antisocial personality disorder clearly does. So do psychotic disorders if untreated. Delusions of control, the kind of paranoia where you believe other people are out to attack you is a predictor of violence, you know, not surprisingly. But if people get treatment, that risk goes back to zero. In fact, as we all know, people with severe forms of mental illness are five times more likely to be victims of violence than to commit it themselves. One other thing about guns. What would the thing we could do tomorrow that would cut the suicide rate in this country by 40% have gun control? More people die by suicide than homicide in our country, and the number one source is guns. So uh, we don't have any longer, but y y that's my feeling about that. One more. Oh. Countdown. I, I think we're probably... Pretty okay. close to out of out of time. I I, I can't thank you. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for coming. And 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 I didn't know a fraction of what you shared with us today about ADHD and the interrelationship with other conditions. So um, I, for one, have learned an enormous I mean, amount. That's why I got interested in the first place? It's if you're interested in genes and biology and medication treatments, and you're interested in context and influence and trauma and psychosocial. It's perfect fertile ground. It's just pure luck. I got into it. One of my advisors in grad school was studying hyperkinesis. And so I've stayed, I do a lot of other things, but if you're interested in being a non-reductionist and really looking at the big picture, ADHD, you can help a lot of people and you can learn a lot. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, Nami Moran. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. What a great kickoff. Thank you. Bye, yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.